Hi everyone, I uh, just wanted to go through with you how to structure an answer to an intoxication question. So for the intoxication defence I just wanted to go back to this slide which I'll make available as a link underneath the video. I think it's really useful in particular for this defence to approach a question using this as it really helps uh, you sort of uh, answer it. So first question we're asking ourselves is, <clears throat> was the defendant intoxicated by either alcohol, drugs or solvents or a combination of all? And of course, if the answer is no, then naturally there is going to be no uh, defence of intoxication should uh, the defendant have uh, committed a crime. However, if we go down to yes, the next question is, was intoxication voluntary? In other words, did the defendant freely choose to become intoxicated? Um, and of course, if the answer here is no, then it is a complete defence, um, provided the defendant doesn't have the mens rea. And what I would perhaps add in here is at any point uh, in a problem scenario, if there's some clue or indication that the defendant does form the mens rea for the offence, despite being intoxicated, then even though um, it is involuntary, not of their own free will, to become intoxicated, it would be enough for the prosecution to establish liability. And we saw that, uh, though it's not on this diagram, we saw that in a couple of cases, you'll remember. The case of Kingston, which is where the defendant, who was um, a paedophile, he was blackmailed by another person who had actually um, spiked his drink and set up an opportunity for him to abuse uh, a, a sort of young boy uh, who was I think uh, asleep or unconscious in the room and the idea being that he was going to then blackmail him uh, later with the, with this and the defendant argued <clears throat> that if he hadn't have been involuntarily intoxicated his drink being spiked then he wouldn't have done those things to the boy and of course that uh, didn't wash as an excuse because he clearly knew what he was doing he had formed the mens rea for that offence and likewise there is the other case i think we've we've also mentioned before of um gallagher which is where um person was i think institutionalized uh for his mental health sort of uh, psychosis and so forth which uh was brought on by his drinking and, and was done so uh, by his wife. When he was eventually released uh, from the institution, he, he blamed his wife for his incarceration. So one of the first things he did was uh, subsequently to go and buy a knife and some, I think it was some vodka, and then to drink that. And in, in essence, developing what we call Dutch courage, you know, his inhibitions were lowered sufficiently that he knew by drinking he would have the the courage to kill her, which of course he did. Now again, that won't be an excuse uh, and won't allow for this defence to succeed either because once more, the mens rea has been, um, you know, is present uh, for that offence, which was murder. But, but typically, uh, as I put here with Hardy, it's a complete defence because in this situation, the defendant who was breaking up with his girlfriend and was quite sort of upset about it all he ended up finding some valium tablets in his i think in a drawer that belonged to his girlfriend they were out of date but the natural viewpoint is that when you take valium it is a drug that is meant to calm you or relax you uh, he had never taken this drug before hardy and so when he did it actually had an adverse effect where he blacked out and he ended up setting fire to, <clears throat> I think, the wardrobe in, in, their, in their bedroom and being charged with arson. Now, of course, he had no recollection of that. And because he hadn't taken the drug before and it had this um, effect that really couldn't have been predicted on him, his intoxication was deemed involuntary. And that's why I've got it here as a, as a complete defence. If we go down after that, presuming, of course, that the defendant freely chose to be intoxicated by, by alcohol, drugs or solvents, then the key bit really for this is trying to establish whether or not the crime or crimes that the defendant has committed are one of specific intent or basic intent. Now, what I would say here is, uh, 
firstly a specific intent offence is a crime that we can categorise by its mens rea as one that can only be committed by intent only and that makes these the most serious types of crimes. So intent only crimes that we may have studied on the AQA law course would be things like naturally murder which can only be committed with an intent to kill or cause serious harm otherwise known as malice of forethought express or implied. Uh, another typical offence that we've done would be section 18 uh, grievous bodily harm under the Offences Against the Person Act 1861. Uh, that's really just almost one opportunity removed from murder because it shares part of the mens rea with murder, an intent to cause serious harm, GBH, but the difference being that unlike murder, the victim hasn't died. So those are two examples of specific intent offences. And I think the third one we typically cover on the course is theft. And uh, theft is, again, a specific intent offence <clears throat> because you can only commit it intentionally. You cannot commit it subjectively, recklessly. By that, I mean the defendant cannot, uh, you know, uh, see that there's an unjustified risk in that the property may be appropriated that belonged to the, to the victim. So theft is always carried out with an intent. Um, I think actually the definition is uh, defendant dishonestly appropriates property belonging to another with the intention to permanently deprive the other of it. So it can't be committed any other way. So that would be for specific intent offences, murder, section 18 GBH and theft are just three clear examples. Now, as all of those can only be committed with intent only, then the most serious crimes, they are specific intent offences. And following my arrow downwards, the natural way here is that, again, provided the defendant at any point has not shown mens rea for the offence, that there is a fallback. It means that the intoxication defence will work partially. So murder will fall back to, uh, to manslaughter, um, unlawful act manslaughter perhaps. And uh, we said section 18 GBH, well, that would fall back to perhaps section 20 GBH, so the lesser offence. Um, theft, you've got to be careful of, of course, because there is no basic intent offence that it can fall back to. So in all these instances, it can fall back to a, a lesser basic one where the mens rea includes recklessness. But theft, there is, there is no uh, lesser offence. So you're in the position where, as the defendant, you may be intoxicated voluntarily, but it's just not going to work. So, so typically, for the examiner, I suppose that they're going to, in specific intent offences, give you either perhaps murder or, or Section 18 GBH. <clears throat> and as I said, they fall back to murder, to unlawful act manslaughter, and Section 18 falls back to the basic intent offence of Section 20, because Section 20 GBH says, as the mens rea, that the defendant can intentionally, uh, oh sorry, the defendant intentionally or subjectively recklessly causes some harm, and, and there we are. Now, I've highlighted the case of Lippmann there as an example, and you'll remember, of course, that is the case where the two, uh, sorry, where the defendant with his girlfriend, um, they were voluntarily taking um, the drug LSD, which has the effect of causing hallucinations and paranoia, which the defendant subsequently did go through and believed that he was journeying to the center of the earth, sort of an hallucination, that there were snakes all around him, uh, and that in fact the, his girlfriend in front of him was a snake, a venomous snake that was going to kill him. So he ended up killing his his girlfriend. And it was only later when he sort of um, awakened from his drugged state of hallucination and so forth and reality set in that he realised he'd, he'd killed his girlfriend. Now, in that instance, you would have a fallback to, as I mentioned before, manslaughter. On the other side, basic intent offences. Now, we've learnt many, many more in the AQA course for these. And what we have is 
um, for basic intent offences. This is where any crime by its mens rea can be categorised as also including subjective recklessness as part of its mens rea. Um, so typically the examiner likes to link this to non-fatal offences as a topic. So very briefly, assault, battery, section 47, actual bodily harm, um, section 20, GBH or wounding. So those are the ones typically that, that basic intent offences come across. And to prove that, again, I said that basic intent offences are crimes that can be categorised by their mens rea as containing subjective recklessness. That means the defendant, to prove this, prosecution got to prove the defendant believed or knew they were taking an unjustified risk, but went ahead anyway. The mens rea for assault uh, is that the defendant intentionally or subjectively recklessly causes the victim to apprehend immediate fear of unlawful violence. So, again, recklessness there. Whereas for battery, it would be the defendant uh, intentionally or subjectively recklessly applies unlawful force. And uh, for section 47 ABH, it would be the defendant intentionally or, or subjectively recklessly commits an assault or, or battery. Um, and then I think I said section 20 GBH or wounding, which would essentially be the defendant intentionally or subjectively recklessly um, causes some harm. So all of those crimes have recklessness in there. And what's interesting here is um, there is no defence for a basic offence, a uh, basic intent offence, because the prosecution only need to prove that the defendant was subjectively reckless and the defendant, by becoming intoxicated by either you know alcohol, drugs, solvents or a combination of them voluntarily by their own free choice their free will they have demonstrated a reckless course of action and so there can be no defense um, because their actions prove they've been reckless and furthermore i think this is really a public policy sort of issue here and i guess this is this for aqa law it's an ao3 assessment objective 3 comment for analysis and evaluation, we can say public policy reasons that you know the public need to be protected, and they don't want to lawmakers offer this position where anybody who becomes voluntarily intoxicated has a complete defence because it would not protect the public and and would not serve, I guess, justice either. Um, and it's interesting intoxication defence because it comes under the topic of capacity defences, which is where essentially when you raise this defence, similarly like likewise for insanity or, or automatism, we are saying that the defendant at the time of committing the crime does not have the mens rea. So for insanity, it's because they're suffering from a defect of reason due to a disease of the mind, etc. For automatism, it's due to some sort of uh, external cause uh, instead such as a blow to the head that has led the defendant not to be voluntarily in control of their body so you know as a result of a spasm or a reflex or whatever they've committed a crime perhaps they've lashed out at someone while they were having this episode and in all those instances they're complete defenses but when you get to the intoxication defense um, there is that public policy consideration that they don't want to allow it and so it's an interesting kind of um, dilemma really isn't it so this is a defense intoxication but it's not a complete one and in fact it can only ever be a partial one to specific intent offenses um, only will it be complete as I said earlier if the intoxication was involuntary not of their free will and the defendant does not form the mens rea at the time, like the paedophile did in the case of Kingston. Anyway, um, in my next video, I'm going to go through an exam question and how to answer it. So I hope this has been useful. Link to this uh, below. Thanks very much for listening.